many people have um, been involved in raising pasture poultry, you know, like less than five years, less than two years, just to kind of get an idea of what we're dealing with. But um, the most important thing is just talk about the fundamentals of pasture and poultry. And, and obviously that's about the pasture. And so I just want to talk, I want to spend the next hour talking about um, things that you're looking for uh, to observe the pasture, things that you are um, doing to um, leave the pasture better, not just for this year and next year, but for years to come. Um, and how that is a little bit synergistic with the other animals that are on your farm. Um, and just of note, this is my first Zoom presentation. So uh, bear with me and this might be a little bit sketchy or rusty, but um, should, be, should be fun. So I look forward to, to sharing the next time with y'all. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to jump into the, the pictures and the shared screen because again, it's a lot more interesting than looking at that than looking at my head. So, um, we're going to do that and just use those to bounce off the different subjects, but do whether it's in the comment section or whether you just need to unmute and ask a question. Um, please definitely jump in to ask a question and um, and try to make that happen. But yeah, um, if you can ask it in the comments and then um, and then we'll try to get to it. We'll definitely between Mike and I will be watching the comment section to, to get a question taken care of. Um, all right, so we're going to share screen here. That one? Okay. I have my uh, teenage tech support with me, so we should be good to go. <laughs> All right. Okay. Are we follow on? Yep, there you go. Hey, Dave, are we working on that? Can you see the screen? Yep, okay. we're good. Cool. All right. Um, and we're like, Okay, great. I know we're saying like, why are we looking at cows when we're talking about pasture poultry? Um, <clears throat> I think the important part is talking about movement and migration. Um, that's the two words that are very important when we really think about this, realizing that we're raising animals in a land ownership setting and that you have a, a limited space that's yours to control, but that we're trying to mimic migration. Um, so certainly cattle and, and herbivores uh, are one of the first things that we think about when we talk about migration. Um, but uh, that is one of the, the thoughts that we need to put into our mind of what migration should look like. And it's this daily constant movement and transition from one place to another um, and leaving the old place behind. Um, because if we don't do that, we're not actually migrating, we're just stagnating. And so it's important that we think about it from that perspective is what what migration looks like and what full kind full-time pasture looks like um and and what it can look like from a complete what we call complete growth steady so does does the pasture have complete regrowth and the cows of course are a great example of that um these are just some water pictures that i happen to have in the same presentation, just the, the portable water is important because that's going to come in later. As we move things, portable water is critical. Um, whoops, let me back up. Um, so these are our cattle water stock tanks um, are completely portable. We move those daily with the cows as well with the temporary electric fence. Um, and of course, flow valve fills the tank. You guys are pretty well up on this, but the buried water system is important to us that get a little colder. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I feel for y'all even further north, we got to bury it six feet or something. But anyway, the idea is to have potable water at a very close, easy access. Um, because if we don't have water, ultimately, um, Jeff will probably talk about this in his presentation later, but the idea that an animal actually takes in way more water in a day than they do feed. And when you think about that, it means that the water has a way bigger impact on their daily diet and the way their overall health is um, affected uh, than the feed potentially because of, of what can be in the water. So anyway, um, the portable potable water is very important to have available um, and, and to have it for the, for the cattle and for the chickens and as you move along. Um, I show this picture just to demonstrate some mosaic and just I'll use the word mosaic and that means a patchwork um, of, of settings. And so you can see the graze lines of the cattle there. And we're going to see that in the poultry as well. Um, 
we're portable about everything. This is just one of our portable shade structures. Um, I'm going to breeze through that. You can use it for turkeys. These are the cattle one. Um, we can use them for, uh, they hold about 70 head under each one of those. Um, they're just hay wagon chassis extended out. They also work really well for turkeys and we'll see kind of a different model uh, later on, but for large flocks of turkeys, they work really well as well. Um, all right, so then the cattle, the cow is the, is the depositor of massive amounts of, of manure and urine. Whoops, wrong way, sorry. Um, let's get to true pasture poultry. We use the layers um, to follow the cows and they're totally free range in those egg mobiles. Um, to scratch through the cow pies and eat out the fly larva. Um, a couple of key things talking about pasture and pasture length. Um, burr, and we, we use this template behind nature because that's the best teacher is nature. Um, chickens follow herbivores, and that's why I started with cows in this presentation, was to talk about how that looks um, because cattle need carbohydrates, poultry need protein, okay, right? Some of you have done this a long time, you know what the drill is. Um, but a grass plant that is two and a half feet tall is very high in carbohydrates. Um, and a plant that is two or three inches tall, regrowing very quick, the new green stuff is very high in protein. And so it, the mosaic is very important um, I think those of us who are raising pasture poultry and trying to manage without some, manage the pasture without some type of grass eating larger species, it can be sheep, goats, cows, certainly a, a tractor and mower works. But the idea of preparing the table and preparing the pasture so that you can put the poultry on exactly the kind of grass that they need um, and uh, to, to be able to to use what, um, uh, to be able to see what they're doing. Sorry, a little bit of technical issues over here. Anyway, um, so what we're looking at is how do we manage the pasture to best encourage grass intake by the birds? That's what you're trying to accomplish because otherwise you might as well put them in a house and it's not pasture poultry, right? So the idea of preparing the grass so that it's at the optimal level um, for the uh, birds to eat is what we're trying to accomplish. And nothing does that better than the cow, okay? So, I mean, if you have cows, great. If you can have cows and get cows, great. But very few things do it as well as a cow. Um, they certainly can graze it off best. They can, um, the, the, there's lots of studies showing how the grass plant responds to the actual gentle tugging of the cow biting it off as opposed to a mower or a mechanical harvest. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to talk about pasture management and that leads to pasture intake of the bird. And um, so how can we do that best? So the realizing that nature follows um, that cows or that birds follow cows um, or herbivores in nature is one of the important things to realize. Um, try to mimic that as best you can because that's going to give you the best pasture management. All right, and I am unable to move to my next picture. Hold on a second. Um, I'm not moving to the next picture. Oh, okay, that works, thanks. Um, all right, a little bit about the egg mobile structure. I think that was one of the things we wanted to talk about as well is the different structures. Um, a lot of great pictures look like they're in Dave and Dave presentation. So um, I'll have a few different ones. Um, certainly our, our mobile layers have um, the, the ability to go in and out of the of the egg mobile. Um, these are completely on wheels and they are moved every one to two days, depending on how fast the cows are moving. And we will, um, and they will take um, basically a 450 to 800 bird flock, depending on the size. Um, these structures are um, the structures that we like the best if I have a better picture of them. They carry their own feed box. Um, 
there's a slat, they have slatted floors underneath with feeders inside, nesting boxes. Um, let's see if I have a better picture. Um, so that larger one uh, behind this young lady handles, um, it is a uh, 10 by 20 frame size, and that can handle about 400 birds. Remember that those birds are not sleep, or not spending a lot of time in there during the day. They're mostly just sleeping. And that changes your square footage requirements a lot because they're not actually uh, spending constant daily activity. They go in to get a, some feed, they go in to get uh, to lay their eggs, but then ultimately they're spending all their time outside. And so the square footage requirement changes immensely when all they have to do is go to sleep. Um, this is just a screenshot of a nutrient profile test that, um, that we had done. Uh, showing uh, USDA standard egg versus a polyface egg, which would be uh, representat representative of um, uh, pastured eggs around the US that are, that are moved regularly. And it just kind of gives you a basic idea of the differences um, in the vitamins and the beta carotene, omega-3s, cholesterol, saturated fat, et cetera. Um, and I know uh, Mike mentioned that we will, all of these will be, uh, recorded and shareable for the next little bit, at least so you can um, follow back on that. But that's just a picture of that. Um, again, this presentation is used in different ways sometimes. So um, I just asked the question on this one, uh, which one do you like to live next to? <laughs> and uh, have, be able to look over the fence and, and enjoy uh, the neighbors a little bit better as much as we uh, you know, appreciate our, our neighbors from all walks and beliefs and, and decisions. Um, we would rather live next to the upper one. So anyway, that's just that. So that, that structure on the top photo has the ability of carrying just under 900 birds. Um, and those are uh, 10 foot by uh, 20 foot structures on wheels. All right, here's another structure and another way of doing layers. Um, check on the chat here real quick. We have a couple of questions, Daniel. If you want to, you if you want to take them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yep. Should no, I just no, check you, them on the chat or check them? You, okay. you can if you can What's keep that? up with it. Yeah. If you can keep up with it, go for it. There's one about nitrogen, and there's one about. Oh, geez. Okay. <laughs> uh, the question. <laughs> the question is, what are your thoughts on soil capacity to utilize the nitrogen? Got it. Okay. I will get to that when we get to the broilers. That's a great question. And I'm going to hit that on the broilers. If I don't cover it, please circle back. And you were, yep. you, I got one directly um, to me. You were asking, you were talking about the following the, the herbivores. Uh, the question here from Kasha yes. is, are there risks to poultry, um, like broilers and turkeys, uh, to following behind pig hmm. pasture? Great. Yeah. Pigs are, pigs are, are cows. No, um, that's the beautiful thing about following nature is that, that, that cow, chickens following cows or following pigs does not create any risk to poultry at all. Um, there's, I mean, aside from them, you know, maybe, uh, well, no, there's no, there's no disease risk. Let me follow that. There's no disease risk um, for, for pastured poultry following um, cattle in any way. Um, and that's, that's the natural cycle of things. And that makes it really awesome. So it just, it, the nice part about it is it creates synergy. And because of that symbiotic relationship between the two species, you create incredible, um, you know, two plus two equaling eight in, in scenarios as opposed to, to competitive situations. So no, uh, chickens following cows is just a bonus for everything. Um, so a different design here, this is what we call our feather net. Uh, this would be a little bit more of a day range comparison, um, if you will. But these are all still for layers. I'll get to meat birds, I promise. Um, but these are these are layers, and um, they are in the uh, Premier Electric netting. Um, there we go. Uh, the Premier Electric netting, which again, I'm sure many of us are familiar with. We can just pick it up, uh, move it to the next section. We set up two uh, connecting uh, paddocks, and then just open up one paddock. Um, you can see the, the foreground of this photo is the new paddock. Um, the the uh, behind the scenes there is where the, the birds have been before. Then we can just open up the middle 
uh, wire between the two. And um, the birds, of course, quickly learn that the fresh grass, fresh bugs, everything on the new paddock and move in very, very quickly. Um, everything is chained together. I don't know if you see it in that photo. There's um, a chain connecting the feed box. Some of these photos are slightly dated, but the, this is, you know, some first gen stuff. We've got third, fourth and fifth gen <laughs> stuff on this. But um, the, the basic principles of everything being hooked together. So when we hook to it with, a, a, as you can see, they're a fairly light tractor. It's a, um, that's a 60 horse tractor, but we've used 40 horsepower tractors before. Um, even a, a heavy duty truck is fine. And when the ground is in the right condition. Um, and then the whole structure pulls together. Okay. Um, we use, uh, we started out with battery chargers, of course. Um, now the solar chargers have advanced and we're using solar chargers as well. Um, and uh, those are working great to operate these birds. Again, this structure here, um, this is a great photo of this um, setup. This is our feather net and it has a thousand birds in it. Um, you can see that this is more uh, multiple generations afterwards. We've got the uh, uh, feed box up front on wheels connected to the structure and the um, netting is around it in about a quarter acre. That's three nets together. So that's three of the hundred and um, sixty foot or you know the larger metered size. <laughs> Um, set and they go around, it creates about a three, uh, a quarter, or, excuse me, it creates about a quarter acre paddock. And from that perspective, then we move these birds every three days. Um, the closer look of the structure, um, again, it's not the only design in the world, but it's a pretty cool design in that it was one of the first designs that created the ability to have very little touching the ground and so very little things to run over the birds. Um, this does not require someone chasing the birds from behind or checking. You can do this one, one person can move this structure um, without running over birds because in, as you can see in this photo, if you look to the left, bottom left, you see the chain connecting to the um, uh, skid down in the bottom and the same is true on the other side, and that's the only thing on the ground. There's no cross member because of the X trussing um, in the structure. So you've got the X truss, which creates the stability and the strength, and there is um, nothing else on the ground. So we've got roost bars going up both of those X's. We have a catwalk or a walk there that you can get up and gather the eggs very quickly. Um, you can, of course, these are just old nesting boxes that we got over out of old poultry facilities. Um, so you can use those. Of course, the new rollaways work fine too, whatever. But the fact is that you can walk right up the middle of the structure and collect the birds, collect the eggs, and, um, and not be hunched over and back down. Um, so um, the rotation. So that's an every three-day rotation. That's very important. Um, we do use guardian dogs. Um, we have just... Um, uh, we're in the, in the in exchange process. We need to decide if we're going to get more guardian dogs. We've had our last one that we had for about 15 years finally um, make his last run. So we're trying to figure out what we're going to do next. Um, but the netting is very effective for predation aside from aerials. If you have, you know, massive hawk pressure or something like that, um, then that's where the dog comes in handy, uh, has been our, our most effective part. Um, any questions on the layer structures there, Mike? Um, I am having trouble keeping up with the feed and the. Whoops. Shoot, um, on. Nothing on your nothing on your structures. There's just some. Uh, there was a question about okay. pasture management and about do you do any seeding? Of, of okay, got pasture. it. All right, all right. We'll get into that. We get to broilers. Yeah, yeah. Better look at that for broilers. Okay, cool. Um, How many dogs do you use, Daniel? Um, we had, we really just had one um, in the original setting. We just had one and it covered the whole property, about a hundred acres. Um, but uh, as I said, we, he's not with us anymore, um, which is a, a bummer, but um, we just had the one, it covered the whole property and uh, extremely effective when he was in his prime, um, as opposed to the last few years where he's kind of just guarding the front porch <laughs> when, yeah. when he wasn't too interested in running. But, but um, you know, as you're talking about the pasture management, um, uh, I'll have better pictures of it when we get into outside of the broilers. I'm just going to skip through these brooder sections because um, 
Dave and Dave covered those very, very well. Yeah, and there was um, a question about brewer. your um, there was a question about your netting grounding out. Do you have any any problems with that grounding out in longer grass? So there again, pa pasture length. Yeah, pasture length is so important with chickens. Remember the favorite, and I'll show better pictures as we get to the broilers, but the favorite pasture length for broilers and for poultry in general is, um, uh, get to, yeah, there we go. That's a more enjoyable picture to leave it on, um, is about four to six inches. A couple of key things about pasture when you're talking about uh, chickens. Chickens are a highly preyed upon species. So, for them, big scary things live in the tall grass, okay? And so tall grass equals, you know, total stranger danger, stay out, don't go in there. Um, it also doesn't have a lot to offer in the form of protein. Now it does have seeds and it can have lots of cover for worms and, and top living things that they can get into. However, it's not a specific, again, it's not as beneficial to them as the short high protein grass. So remember, the, the best thing they can do is, um, is to jump on a, um, sorry, I'm fixing my video here, um, is to jump on a, Mike, can you still hear me? Yes, you're good. I, I turned your video okay, off. Sorry. You were lagging a little bit. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so the four, four to six inch grass is perfect because it's high in protein. The chickens don't mind going out to range in it and it has the best benefit for them. Also, looping back to the netting shorting out question, that keeps your netting from shorting out very much um, because it is not very tall grass. It's very easy to set up so that the, the um, netting can be very tight on the bottom and tight at the top. Um, and it's not uh, hump, coming up over grass uh, as you're as you're moving it. So yeah, that short grass just has a lot of benefits um, throughout all of the pasture management setting. Um, so that number, that magic number for me is anywhere from four to, to six inches. And when you get to eight inches, it's starting to get too long already and you should be thinking about bringing in the cows. I know for those of you who are cattle folks um, or have experience with cows, I know that that can be, that's too short really for cattle grazing efficiently. I mean, unless your dairy operation, um, but for the sake of the chickens, it's the right time to start thinking about bringing the cows back in. Okay. Um, and it's very helpful to your pet, to your spark and, and keeping your spark up. But even so, as long as we have like one or 1 1.5 spark on that netting, we're containing the chickens and keeping predators out. We have not had problems keeping predators out with a spark of just one to uh, one and a half. It's not been a problem. Um, all right, let's keep, these are just some mobile broilers, um, mobile brooders that we have, um, just different things. I'm good. Um, some different things that we've used before um, that uh, are good for portable and small scale brooding. Um, and have worked well for us. This is just an inside look. This one broods about 300 birds at a time. All right, let's get out to the pasture. Um, so if you're, if you're taking notes, a couple of key things, we talked about pasture length. That's uh, definitely number one. We talked about migration and rotation. That's key. So for us on the broilers, um, it's everyday movement. Uh, layers, it can be um, up to three days with a feather net, but the daily to every two to three day rotation is incredibly important. Um, so that's that's the next key to pasture management is the rotation. So we've got pasture length, we have um, rotation, um, and now we have uh, rest, okay? Um, that is that is our and the nice part is that we've got rotation, we have rest. That's the next thing. For broilers, we recommend one year. Um, in the rest period because of nitrogen deposit. So the question about nitrogen is that a chip, we cannot run, if you run more than 1,000 birds on an acre, that puts down enough nitrogen for the entire year on that pasture based on you know recommendations from 
um, uh, USDA or, or extension services or things like that, pasture management, or, or soil management folks. Um, a good active decomposition, healthy soil can take more than that. But just for a baseline, it's good to, to run off of, of those numbers. So laying hens put down less because there's not as many, they're not as dense per acre. So the, the, the important thing to know is you can look up Google how much manure one chicken produces in a day. And um, the, the, some of the numbers that I've found is, is, um, is one chicken will produce about eight, um, let's see. Um, uh, a thousand birds on the acre will produce about 100 to 120 pounds of manure per um, per acre there, and um, uh, that's not right. Sorry, scratch that. Um, checking my notes here. Anyway, the key the key is you're watching your nitrogen levels per um, per acre. So if you if you're looking up um, if you're talking to like a, a, a land management specialist or whatever, and they say, okay, you can only put this many pounds of nitrogen per acre, um, and a chicken puts down this many pounds of nitrogen, you can do the math. But the key is that the layers put down a lot less nitrogen per acre because they're not as dense as the broilers. So the math that we've run is a thousand birds per acre per year. Um, and with the little mobile shelters that we use, it's one time, one day on that um, spot per, per year, and that's it. Um, so it's important that you remove the nitrogen from the soil, and not all of it, I mean, but you have to use up. Uh, those of you who've raised birds, you know how they turn it green and they make it look incredibly um, uh, rosy, rosy green behind it as they, as they move forward. Um, you need to, you, we call it the candy bar green. That candy bar green is what is keeping the, um, that's what you need to use up before the next poultry comes back to that same landscape. Um, typically for us, it's about a year. I mean, if you live in a climate where you have a lot longer, excuse me, a lot longer growing season, then you could potentially get back on a little faster. Um, but depending on how many harvests, it usually set, we usually figure on between two and three um, cuttings of the grass plant between chicken um, our applications. So in our climate, we can usually graze two to three times behind the chickens after the chickens have passed. And then that takes care of the uh, of the high nitrogen level, and then the chickens can go back on uh, later. Okay. Um, I know that's not an exhaustive answer to the nitrogen question, but again, our rule of thumb is one pass of broilers per year, and um, and that takes care of it. All right. All right. So you got to remove removal of the nitrogen, and that's of the production. So we got to do that. Um, the next thing is. Um, reconnaissance, recon, observation of the pasture. What does it look like? So we've got chickens. Um, but let me get to that next. I want to talk about uh, movement. Um, just the portability of this, that we use the dolly to go under that, um, the movement of the birds, the next paddock. Um, so you can talk. So when we're talking about reconnaissance, looking at what the pasture looks like pre chicken and post chicken. So as you back up here, you can see. There's a good slide of seeing what the, the grass should look like ahead of the birds. That's beautiful, you know, four to six inch pasture. And then as we move the birds, what it looks like before. It shouldn't look like a dirt lot, but it should look um, impacted. Um, this grass plant here is, a, is considerably tall. The birds didn't move well in this setting. Um, this is, you know, fully uh, flowered out um, different species here. And the um, chickens did not want to move well into these tall grass and it's hard to pull the shelter over the tall grass etc so keeping it shorter is much better um so here's here's talking about reconnaissance um in the lower slide you can see the the way the grass looks like after the birds had just been there that's right around the feeder you can kind of see the feeder strip there in that lower picture and you can see that the grass is still there and it's not completely ruined this is 
due to the movement and the short time that the animals were there. If we gave them a bigger area, but left them there for a week, we would have dirt lots or dirt spots, spots around these feeders or around the waterers, and it would not come back well. So it's the timing that is important to leave the pasture in a way that it will spring back quickly, utilize the nutrients and the nitrogen, okay, and um, and pick up this, um, and then start to look very quickly like the upper slide where you have this incredible explosion of clover, which uses up nitrogens and nitrogen, and it, but it also, you know, deposits more, but it uses these things up and that allows things to, it allows the plants to utilize it. But if you leave the animals there too long, then you have so much impact that the grass plant can't respond quickly. Um, the next, other thing that you're, you're looking for this, this um, uh, spotting, the, this, this beautiful uh, movement um, typography, if you will, of the, the, the structures. So where you can see each day back behind it as it's coming back. But again, you see the grass coming back very nicely. Um, so you're observing, what does it look like as immediately after the plants have, the, the chickens have been there? You're looking for um, how fast your grass regrows. You know, have you impacted it too heavily? Um, you're looking at what type of grass plants are regrowing. Are you growing back a lot of um, nitrogen type sucking weeds that would typically grow in your uh, barn lot or your corral or maybe where you fed some hay um, or where you had pigs for a few weeks. Just think about what the type of plants that grow there to suck up all that nitrogen, um, where that would be. And um, those are the kind of plants you don't want to see in your pasture behind your chicken shelters, however your chicken shelters look or whatever you're going to, however you're going to move. Um, so that's a key, couple of key spots. You're looking for dead spots in the soil, you know, uh, in the pasture. Are there donuts around where the water was? Are there stri dead strips around the feeders? Those are indications that you're not moving fast enough. You have too many birds per square foot or um, they're too dense around the particular feeder or water and you need to spread that out a little bit because they're too dense in that area. Um, those are all indicators of your moving um, that you're that you're managing the pasture successfully. Um, you're looking for diversity of as well. Um, the kinds of plants and the kinds of, of growth that come back are very important and tell us things. Weeds tell us things. Different plant species tell us things. And so observing what is coming back um, and what is growing the most behind this your your poultry movement, whatever it looks like. Um, is the important part thing to, oh, wait. to Go ahead. Okay, never mind. Um, all right, so um, keys to pasture management, rotation, rest, the removal of the nitrogen and the reconnaissance, the observation. What does it look like? Another thing to look for on the bird itself is how do the birds look? Um, let me back up a little bit. Do the birds look clean? One of the things that our USDA processor that we use every once in a while talks about is our birds are exceptionally clean um, compared to others that they're using because of the movement. Um, if they're not being moved onto fresh green pasture and moved away from feeders and waterers and, and locations like that to where they can um, Get that their feathers will stay dirty and grungy and manure -y. And um, you know, you can see that these birds are a bright white and it keeps your scald water cleaner. You have less potential of, of um, contamination of uh, fecal matter onto your bird as you move them uh, through the processing facility. So the pasture management is just credibly critical to the complete success, start to finish of pasture poultry. Um, and so the keeping those birds clean means they stay healthy. I mean, again, it's like bringing in, um, you know, a million particles of fecal matter versus only bringing in a thousand matters of fecal matter. Um, I just made those numbers up, but you see the principles of keeping it down means you have less to try to keep from getting onto your birds later. Oops, can't go the right way. 
um, watching the birds is incredibly important. Um, time of movement, how often, you know, when you, one of our, our SOPs, our standard operating procedures says that we have to have the birds move before eight o'clock in the morning. We prefer seven, but eight o'clock for sure. Um, why is this? Well, in the summertime, it gets hotter. The birds want to shut down and not graze. And also, the grass is, um, they're up and going and more energetic first thing in the morning. And they're eager to graze more pasture at that point. So we get that used up. And, and we want to get them moved in. So watching how the birds graze. If you're moving them late in the day, you watch them when you move them, they're not grazing. They're just walking around or, or maybe even just getting under the shade again and, and wanting to uh, to just lie down and chill versus being very aggressive, that's aggressive grazing. Um, observe what the birds are eating. Um, typically they're gonna go after the legumes, which is higher in protein, your clovers, uh, things like that, and not as much into your longer grass plants. Certainly they're gonna be interested in seeds and uh, seed drops from before, but again, they're not gonna wanna go into that tall, um, dangerous grass, if you will, because that's where scary things live for chickens. Um, here's another shelter. So talk about this, the, um, the larger shelters. Um, I'm calling them the larger, you know, um, uh, schooners or, or mobile units versus the smaller tractor style, if you will, or the chicken shelters. Um, a lot of pros and cons to both. Um, just depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, it was talked a little bit on our specific chat on uh, Hoover here earlier, uh, a little bit of a comment going on that. Um, but um, uh, da, da, da. sorry, I'm catching up on some of those. Um, so one of the, the upsides of the chicken, the smaller chicken shelters, oops, these style is that they are completely portable. These are 10 by 12 structures they're two feet tall they house uh starting 75 birds by the time you have some mortality along the way you know you might only have 70 birds or 72 three birds by the time you get to, to processing um that is going to give you um the um the square footage you need. So you're looking at 1.7 square feet per bird. I know that was a question on um, Hoova a little bit, I think. Um, so we start out with 1.7 square feet per bird when they're three weeks old. That's nothing. I mean, they have tons of room and when they're old, they're a little bit tight, but it's still big enough to handle um, what, th what they need. Um, but these shelters are completely portable. You can put them on a flatbed, you can take them anywhere. We've loaded up, we can load up, um, eight of these on a 24 foot gooseneck trailer and take them right through the middle of town down to another farm anywhere. Um, they're very um, infrastructure light in that you don't have to have tractor or heavy equipment to move them. Um, one person can move them on their own. Um, you can move them by hand. You can just walk out of your back door, walk out to the pasture, move these shelters. Uh, they are very interchangeable. They're very friendly to um, very uh, different terrain, sloping ground, uh, very rough ground. Uh, they're good for working in and around fruit trees, buildings, vineyards, um, small homesteads where you've got to, you know, put them, we call it nook and cranny farm, and you got to right, use up all the nooks and the crannies. Um, there's um, uh, smaller flock size. So if you have a problem with a, with a flock, you can isolate. If you have a problem with predation, they're only going to get into one of these at a time or getting attacking one of these as opposed to the entire flock. Um, you have the um, upside of, again, weather. Like if you have a cold night, you're not having 400 or 600 or 800 birds packing together in one spot and having problems. You're dealing with just 75 birds in one section. So you have a safety in, in that lack of mass. Um, so those are all upsides to, and there's others too, I, I, I'm sure, but, but those are some of the big ones. Um, the upsides to the bigger uh, structures are, um, we have one, this is actually one that we have used, um, still have, 
found them to be more labor efficient uh, per bird. Uh, we can get into that a little bit if we if we have time as far as our our, our person minutes per bird. Um, but they, we have not found them to be more efficient in person minutes per bird uh, in movement and care in the pasture, even though this structure is holding four to 600 birds and the smaller ones are holding 75 birds. Um, however, they do, um, you know, ease of entrance is good. Um, it is not as physically demanding, so it opens up your labor force uh, to a different group of people. Um, it certainly is um, easier to access in and out. And, um, and again, it, it has its upsides as well. Uh, they're, they're really good. Again, most of these have been pioneered in very flat, very warm climates, California, Texas, um, the, the South. Um, and that is a great, that is where they really, really thrive. We have in our undulating pastures, our up and down pastures, we have a lot of trouble with these, um, with, with holes and, and problems with the birds getting out. That's not to say it's their fault. It's just that it's not a match. So you have to take that into mind. Your climate, um, you know, uh, the high roofs of these uh, designed again, mostly in the South, um, or in warmer climates. Very important. We're closer to the north and the, the mid-north climate. So we've got to work a lot more with keeping the birds warm than keeping the birds cool. So that's important to take care of, realizing this high-roofed building is going to um, allow all the heat to sit up in the, in the peak and get away, which is great for the south. It's not great for, for us in the north or, or a little bit cooler weather. But all of these structures are functional and the fact is the structures, um, as long as they fulfill a couple of key points, one, they're easy to move. If they're not easy to move, you're not going to move them. And then that defeats the, the um, problem with pasture, that defeats the purpose of pasture poultry. They have to be climate matched. Again, I touched on that, so we don't need to rehash that, but they need to be climate matched. Don't just make a polyface style structure if you live in the deep south. Um, it's a great structure, it's a great model, but it doesn't have to be the right one for you. Um, you need at least over 1.5 square feet per bird per day. So we're at 1.7, but at least 1.5 square feet, okay? And that's important, so the bird has enough space, okay? Whether you have a bunch of these or just a couple, it's important that you have that kind of space. Um, and that they have ease of feed and water access. Um, so you saw some of the ones in the smaller shelters that we had going on, and these are also ones that you can walk in and, and fill as well, but, but look, the importance of ease of access. So here we just lift a lid um, back up. So here you can feed and water, you know, right inside. It can move along with you. Some of them hang. Again, these are some first generation pictures of some folks that we know that are running them. Um, and this is our shelters where you've got the water right outside, easy access to the water and easy access to the feed when you move it as well. Um, so that easy of access of water and feed is really critical, both for the bird and for, for, the, for the farmer. Um, but those are the key structure components. Um, you know, we've seen shelters built out of two by fours, they weigh 500 pounds and they never get moved because it's too difficult. Um, so if it's not easy to move, you don't want to, you're not going to move it. So it has to be easy to move, um, has to match it to your climate, has to have plenty of space for the bird and water feed and access. Um, here's just an example of our turkey structure. This is what we call the gobbledygo. Um, this is just a, a structure on wheels, very similar to the cattle um, shade structure. We use the netting for them as well, run groups of flocks of four to, uh, between three and 450. Um, they get moved every two days. You can see the roost bars up there where they can get up off the ground so they don't get um, breast blisters. Um, but again, turkeys can go into much taller grass. They're much more foragers and um, looking for bugs and seeds and things like that and are much taller. So they're not as scared of the tall grass or rougher conditions and climates. Um, because you're using netting, you can put them on very rough terrain, uh, both in its elevation and geography and topography, but also in its um, early access to pasture. Like if you've cut over, if you've say opened up some new pasture that was brushed before or uh, trees before, and it's slowly turning over to pasture, turkeys work well there because um, they don't mind eating some tops of brush and some weeds 
where the chickens will not and the shelters don't move well. Um, again, connecting everything together, uh, feeder, uh, gobbledygook, shade structure, um, cows are preparing the table there in the background and we're watching the impact of the pasture and what the birds look like. Okay, I am going to unshare that. And go ahead and uh, Mike, you've been watching the discussion. So let me let you take that for a second and I'll try to answer as many questions as I can now. Yep, so I got a, I got a couple here. I'll just run through them um, yep. in rapid fire. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you do any sanitizing or washing of your pens in between batches of birds? Great question. No, we do not. The sun is on it all the time. It sanitizes everything. We do wash out the waterer. Um, of course, because it's got, you know, a little bit of algae buildup and stuff naturally. Uh, we do pretty much a weekly wash of that anyway. Um, but we do that in between. Um, no soap or, or cleansers, just a, just a scrubby to scrub out any, you know, funk and gunk that might be in it, algae or whatnot. And then it's ready to go, but no, in the bucket as well. But no, we don't do any sanitizing of the shelters um, between uh, batches of broilers, no. That haven't had any trouble of disease passing. The birds are super out. I mean, we've got bir uh, shelters that have uh, aluminum roofing on them that are older than I am. So we've been having them a long time. Awesome. Got two two cattle questions. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Levi asked, "How do you how do your chickens keep up with the cows?" In his experience, the herd rotates a lot faster than he can move the chickens. Right. Well, so that's that's exactly the case. So that's why you have the multiple structures. Um, that's a great question. And um, so the broilers don't keep up with the cows. They just march along a couple of moves, you know, a move a day. And that's all that they do. What um, what the the chickens that keep up with the cows is the egg mobile. That's the layers. They move along very quickly. They keep um, up with the cows because they can move long distances. They don't cover every square foot that the cows have been on because they don't range out everywhere, but they cover most of it. And that takes care of our fly problem with the cows. It takes care of a lot of our uh, internal parasites. And that's really, um, um, that's probably really, that's the important thing that they do. Um, so it's two, two very different structures and different species to accomplish two different tasks. And you're exactly right. The broilers will never keep up with the cows, but the, um, but the layers in the egg mobile can. The day range, like the layers, uh, the day range layers, they won't keep up with the cows either. They just don't move far enough. But those are two different ways to do it. Yep. Gotcha. And then uh, here's, a, here's an interesting question. We'll just throw it out there. How many days between... Uh, when you graze cattle in the poultry, do you use how many days gap oh. there to protect yeah, yeah. the dung beetle life cycle? Sure. We have dung beetles and we, so we are, um, the, the layers run on a three day delay um, because that's where the um, uh, cow, the fly larva is the largest. And so it has the highest protein content for the, the, um, the chickens to be their carrot to, to dive into those cow pats. Um, we do have dung beetles. We have not found that the dung beetle population has really been infected by the chickens. Maybe we don't have enough to really register and to, to watch. Um, um, but I, I, um, I went to, so we're not seeing the birds having a negative impact on the dung beetle population. Now that being said, like I said, we don't have a large population of them at this point. Um, in our area. So we're looking to see more and we're certainly monitoring them as they come back. Um, and those of you who have larger uh, version uh, or larger uh, populations of those, I'd be interested to see your comments on that, but we have not seen that to be a problem. Um, but yeah, and the birds don't eliminate all the manure, they just spread it out a little bit and make it closer to the, to the soil. So we've had a pretty good um, result with that, haven't seen a negative impact. Yeah, cool. Uh, so I got a I got a couple Go questions here on pasture again. Yep. And uh, before I throw this out to Daniel, I just want to point out that we do have a, a kind of a, a pasture management session built into next Tuesday, I believe, which will allow people to go a little deep in some of these conversations. But um, the question is, Daniel, do you plant any type of forage, like an annual forage that could be planted or drilled to utilize that excess nitrogen mm. and... If so, right. what is it? Yeah, if I start lagging again, you can cut me off again. Um, but yeah, so yeah, we have not, we have done some drilling before, some no-till drill work. 
Um, and that definitely works. Uh, you can suck a lot of nitrogen out of the soil uh, by doing that. Um, and it certainly would be a key piece. The reason we have not done it is because again, you see our landscape, it's not really great for growing some cr larger crops. It's also, we don't have that kind of equipment. We just haven't gone out to buy it or, or have it or, or rent it. Um, so yes, is that effective? Absolutely. That, you know, you brought a crop of corn behind the chickens in a no-till drill setting, that sucks a ton of nitrogen out and would be a great symbiotic relationship if that's what you're set up for. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, I'm looking at some of the other comments too. Um, Brad, you did a larger structure and your tractor wasn't reliable. So you went to a smaller one. Exactly. You can move it by hand. That's an upside of the smaller ones. Um, it depends on where your setting is. That's very key. Um, the trough feeders is all we use at this point. Um, they do run out. So we do do a second service at night for the birds when they get bigger. So it's basically a once a day service for a we have a five foot trough feeder um, just because it fits the best within the shelter. Uh, a little thing that's kind of outside the pasture management because we're talking about the feeder. Um, they recommend one and a half to two inches of linear feeder space per um, chicken. So the long five foot feeder gives me a lot of linear feed trough space per um, the shelter to match the number of birds that are in the shelter. So yes, we use the feeder. It is fine for usually week three, um, three, four, and five. And then we have to go to a second service in week six and seven and or eight if we run them longer. I got, I got Brad McIntyre with his hand up. Do you want to, I think he wants to ask a question in voice. So if you're, you're good, Matt or Brad, you can come on and ask it. You got a window of opportunity here. We, uh, oh, yeah, that was a mistake. Brad. Sorry. Oh, hey, so he made a mistake. Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see what else, what else do we have going on here? Um, there's a question. Uh, it looks like it was sent directly to me, Daniel. Somebody wanted to know when you're running your mobile layer coops, how do you level them to compensate for the slope of the land? Oh, Daniel's reconnecting. Um, so there, there will be a couple things that we need to mention. There will be a um, Q and A session here, just an open Q and A session towards the end of the day, at the very end of the day. Check your agenda for that. But um, all of the presenters will be back on that call to uh, just to answer questions. So if we didn't get you here in this session or any of the other sessions, come back, ask it, and. Uh, I'll mention the same thing that I did when at the end of the last one, which was the Q and A session of the Hoova on the Hoova agenda is open. It's open before it's open after. So you can, you can have a conversation in there, ask more, some more questions. And uh, at some point we can come back in and. and All right. Sorry, Mike, I'm back on. Sorry about that. Go hey, ahead, Brad. I missed that conference or missed that question. Go ahead. No, it, Brad, Brad was, that was a mistake, but the question I did ask um, he, he was okay. just clicking buttons. So um, the question that I did have for you, Daniel, was <laughs> gotcha. um, when you're running yep. a mobile layer coop, how do you level them to compensate for the slope? Uh, so the mobile laying coop, that's a great question. Again, we've used the older like hand gathering nesting boxes and we don't have to level it. We just leave it. And so it can be crooked. It can be upside, downside, tilted, whatever. Um, and we don't, we don't have a problem with it. It's just unlevel. Um, and so that's the one upside about the hand gathering is it doesn't have to be level. Um, so I guess I haven't had to really address that issue. Cool. And somebody's asking about your water, your water system to your, your fuel pens. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Um, yeah. So our water, <laughs> our water system to the field shelters right now are mostly still just the buckets. Um, and, um, the, um, and the, um, 
I'm sorry, the, the gym membership of just toting the buckets to the buckets. Uh, <laughs> so we just move water from, from a tank to the buckets that are on top of the, um, on top of the structures. And that, again, that takes them 24 hours, except for the last week usually, or if it's really, really hot, um, that's when we have to, uh, and the, the tank is really near. Yeah, we move it like once a week, it stays really close and it's, it's good to go. I mean, I've seen some people use some um, uh, maple syrup tubing, uh, low cost tubing to connect to each one. Uh, that's been very effective. Um, I, we just haven't done it yet, um, but usually we run strips of 12 shelters in a row and we can have a tank very close, you know, within uh, 25, 30 yards. Um, that's fine. Um, let's see, have we ever tried putting down biochar over the manure? I'm sure you can, but again, biochar is usually by the time you get that made and taken care of, um, um, that is what you would typically, um, the, the grass is gonna do fine. Typically anything that we try to make as humans and put on is not as effective as just the soil itself. So acting at, having an active live microbial life in the soil is one of the key components to a successful um, nutrient use, nitrogen use, and that's kind of important. Um, so I, I just think that it's better off to let the ground try to do the work than to, um, try to do something we bring in. So again, can it work? Sure. Um, we have not done it ourselves, but I know that it has worked and it can work. Um, yeah. Seeing you say use a million feet of garden hose. Um, yeah, the, the, um, sap tubing, the sap, uh, tubing is something that we've seen really work well and it, it's, um, holds up in the sun and, um, it's not nearly as expensive as garden hose. So that might be a trick you can use. Cool. I think I've missed a couple in the back. Somebody talk about going through the nitrogen um, again, just the fact that a thousand birds on an acre puts down as much nitrogen as that can handle in a given season. Um, and I don't wanna get lost in the weeds of like nerding out on parts of nitrogen per dropping and how many, pieces, how many pounds of nitrogen a chicken puts down on its life. But those are the big numbers. And you can certainly jump into Google research and, and find some, some um, information on how, how much nitrogen each bird puts down. But, but the key is how many puts that. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Jeff. There's a link there in the comment section about jumping on for, for the nutrient profile. Again, I look at the, I look at big numbers and just what's really important as far as how many birds you can put per acre. Um, and, uh, and not so much the individual bird and, and nitrogen, but yeah, good, very, that's the key. Knowing um, what it should look like and knowing how many birds you could put per acre is important. Um, since I cut out there, I missed some questions and my chat's not coming back. Uh, I think we got them. Uh, what type of hose? Okay, so the um, sap tubing hose. So like for collecting maple syrup, if you go to like a maple syrup supply um, uh, website, they will have uh, the, I think it's like quarter inch or half inch sap tubing. And it's very cheap per square foot. You buy it in like 100 to 300 foot rolls. And um, it's been pretty effective on some places that I've seen. Cool. Hey, Daniel, I got and, I and even a, using, go ahead. No, no, finish your thought. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, it's very effective even for some, like putting it on a garden hose reel where you can wind it up on like the egg mobile or um, the feather net. And you still have to have water to everything. Um, whether you're carrying it to the bucket or not, and it works that way. Hey, there's there's one question I want to ask you, and I think this will probably be the last one we get for you, um, but I think it's a pretty important one. For the smaller wooden mobile chicken tractors, how thick of, do you make the wood? Like, how do you how do you keep from building that thing too heavy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we do use uh, again. That's what was available in our area. We did use pressure treated wood because it lasts outside. Um, it's not my favorite, but it does um, you know keep up over the years. Um, so we use pressure treated wood. Um, the bottom pieces are two by twos. Uh, so they're two by four ripped in half. Um, and so they're a little less than two by two. And then the most of the other side pieces and upper pieces are one by three or one by sixes ripped in half. So they're actually like two and a half. Um, and uh, we also, I'll put a little plug in here. We, um, uh, one of our past apprentices uh, just helped finish up a Polyface Designs book. And it has a complete layout of exactly how to build the structure and um, all the different things you need. Um, um, 
and and all the different cuts and sheets and things like that if you're interested in the exact blueprints of how to build one of those structures um yeah good comments on the size and shape there um on the cool. on the um comments as well okay we're gonna have to Stick a fork in it right there, Daniel. Thank you so yep. much for uh, sounds good making your way to town. Thanks for keeping up. Thanks for keeping up with us, everybody, and the technical issues. And awesome, Mike. Thanks for covering me here. Um, just a, a note: I'll be back for the Q and A session, um, and I know I'm going to be back to help, um, not help, but to be along with um, uh, Bruce. And when we talk numbers as well, talking about uh, SOPs, how long it should take per bird, how many seconds per bird. Uh, cost analysis and things like that. So I think Bruce is going to do an awesome job there, but I'm going to help with him on that. So looking forward to seeing y'all soon. All right, cool. Thank you. <sighs> okay. Um, Sue, where are you at? I'm here. All right. What's your What's our next stop here? Well, we had a we had a breakout room scheduled for uh, maybe ten minutes or so, just so everybody gets a chance to maybe speak one on one with everybody. Uh, we can assign the the group. We've got one hundred and thirty five people or something, and let's drop them out into breakout rooms of oh, what do you think? Maybe eight people a room, and for, for uh, time. Just, uh, we can do that now and uh set a set maybe a 10 minute breakout and then jeff will start the next session at uh, at uh, 1 30 so that'll give people a time to tend some personal needs and stretch and do what they need to do okay you want to so set them you, up or you want me to set them up go ahead and set them up i'll i'll, I'll give some instructions here um so we're gonna if you if you want to just kind of whittle this room down into a, a few small rooms uh we're gonna set up some breakout room features in, in Zoom, uh, which will match you up with some people and uh, just kind of meet and greet and get to know somebody. And uh, Jeff will be, Jeff Maddox will be live at 1.30 to um, talk about uh, feed and nutrition. Okay, th this is going to send you guys through some magical mystical thing your screen will go dark and it'll open up and you'll be in a room with uh, whoever the the magic zoom lady assigns you to and uh, we'll give you a countdown when we're when we're ready to ready to bring you up and you'll end up all back here together. So I'm going to send you now. See you later. Wow, they're really disappearing. Yeah. Going away. It's like working. I hope you don't hurt anybody's feelings.
Mike, do I need to go out and come back in? No, you're good right where we are. All right. When I tried to share a screen, it wouldn't let me, so. Yeah, not yet.